Salute. Welcome to Ralph Reads. Brought to you by T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks. My name is Ralph Anthony Garcia, also known as R4. The legal, the loyal, the regal, the royal Ronin Ralph, your master of ceremonies. Please like, share, comment, subscribe, tell a friend to tell a friend to tune in to T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks. Also, visit the music channel at RGMC2407 and you might very well find your favorite hip-hop instrumental or movie theme. I even started to include comedy albums. Check it out at RGMC2407. And of course, right here, T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks. We are Ronin. On today's edition of Ralph Reads, we get legal with volume 18 of the beloved Sister Soldiers. Midnight, a moment of silence. 18! My bad, I had to do that. 51 years of age, so I'm no new jack. Allow me to prove that. I get intense. Let the reading commence. Chapter 29 Unexpected, I was not a passenger on a passenger ferry with other passengers whose destination was the same as mine. Martha's Vineyard. Instead, I was on a pretty private yacht named American Dream, owned by his captain, Clementine Moody. The aerodynamics of the body were nice and sleek. However, it was the interior that was fully fine and fresh. Cherry wood floors and the cockpit wooded out as well. White leather high back couches, a beautiful leather recliner with burgundy piping and stitching, and cherry wood cabinets and tabletops. Part of the Grand Bank's heritage yacht collection, the East Bay 55SX, was a definite luxury item. Uncle Clem had the sound system on low volume. A nice Miles Davis jazz cut I did not recognize the title of but I like the feeling of the groove. So many beautiful things. Try not to lust them, I reminded myself. Then I also reflected that I have been on yachts ten times the value of this expensive one with my father on business with the caked up Arabs cruising in the deep Red Sea. Also, I reminded myself that no matter how beautiful a material thing is, nothing is more beautiful than the sunset sky that Allah created. So I steadied myself for whatever it was that Clementine Moody wanted. Because of the fight I had with his son, Marcus, I knew there could be anything on his mind. At the same time, I was hopeful that Marcus was not a coward who ran and called his father to finish the fight that he started and lost. If he did, I would lose any remaining respect I might have had for him as a man. He returned to the plush sitting area where he had invited me to take a seat, still wearing his captain cap, but with a Winchester shotgun in one hand and a Kodomatic 980L Insta camera in the other. Don in his pink Ralph Lauren shirt, white khaki shorts, and Sperry top sider shoes, he didn't look threatening to me. However, my mind was swiftly calculating the possibilities of which way this scenario might move. Was he planning on getting Marcus's revenge by murdering me and taking photos of my corpse to show and then tell his son, This is how it should be done! Was he planning to hold me hostage and shoot photos of me to attach to his ransom note? Nah... Who would he get ransom from? Was he planning to blow my head off and dump my body in waters that were unknown to me in a place where I had never been before and make it appear to my mother, sister, and wives that I had broken my promise to come join them and had abandoned them instead? 
was Marcus sitting in another room in the boat hoping his father would negotiate a truce. I'm going to have the bourbon, he said after setting down the camera and prepared himself a drink. Since you are underage, I'll offer you to drink my sons have had since they each turned 12. A glass of shikama wine made right here on the vineyard. What's the shotgun for? I got right to it. Ignore this thing. I use it when I go duck hunting, he said. Duck hunting? On a boat? With the Winchester, a man might have had one purpose for having it at first, but then a man and his gun get attached and somehow roll together. Next thing you know, you're carrying it everywhere because you'll miss it if it's gone. He laughed two quick, insincere chuckles. In one of her photos, I was unzipping my jacket from her body. In the other, she was smiling and trying on the jacket I purchased, which was nothing great, but it had long sleeves and was long enough for her to pull over her hips and to cover her ass. All of the photos seemed like they were snapped, not for the art of photography, but to confirm something the way a private investigator would confirm that two people had met. So, I said, my face blank. Instead, I was thinking of who could have snapped the shots and how could I have possibly overlooked a person following me. But Penn Station on 34th Street in Manhattan is a major thoroughfare and there are thousands of people passing through at all times of the day and night, every day. So, Clementine Moody repeated, when it comes to men, too good to be true is always an illusion, isn't it? He asked me. Good and true are the same thing, in my estimation. If a man is good and true, why would that be an illusion? I asked, trying to follow his reasoning. He smiled. Slick talker, but there's only you and me here on the open waters. You can drop. The whole religious routine. Save that for your wife, he said. Routine? How about you just get to your point? I didn't expect to see you on the Amtrak platform. You asked me to follow you here. Out of respect, I did. I don't think we came here to discuss these photos. At least I hope not. You're right. These photos are just a precursor to let you know that I see you clearly and that I have a documentation of one of your secrets. All men have secrets, isn't that right? He asked. And if any woman were to look at these photos of this pretty young thing wearing your jacket, the same one you have on right now, what would she think? He asked and gave a devious smile. If you were in these photos with a woman other than your wife, I guess based on your presentation today, it would be a problem for you. It would not be a problem for me. I answer to Allah, as each man and woman should. No woman controls my actions. I control my actions and my choices, and only I am responsible for the consequences of each of my decisions, I said calmly. This is the first July 4th in more than a decade where my whole family has not been together in the same place at the same time. In fact, my wife and your mother and family, all of the women, are up here at the vineyard together. My sons, I had to hold them back, break a huge tradition of family gathering that we have always looked forward to. I don't know what you are accustomed to because you and me are really strangers thus far. But I won't allow you to cause me any losses without collecting the debt. He said, sipping. Debt, I repeated. I understand numbers. Speak to me in numbers. That way, I can follow the conversation, I told him. You might be a good businessman like you say that you are. You might even be swift with numbers. But remember, son, you are too young to be wise. Wisdom comes very slowly through years of effort, of making mistakes, of feeling the pain, sometimes even the torture of the reality 
of life. In business, wisdom comes after making some great decisions and then some foolish decisions and paying the price of your losses. Men who have gone bankrupt one time oftentimes become the wisest businessmen. He was holding a shotgun, leaning on it like it was a walking stick while sitting not in the chair or on the couch or recliner, but on the countertop. I took it as him wanting to stay posed in a higher position than me and reinforcing his pose with his weapon. I didn't have my nine, but I was confident that my skilled hands and feet were more than sufficient to handle this older man to disarm him. It would only be self-defense. I had no plan to attack or injure him in any way. My second wife is in his family, loves him and his wife and sons a great deal, and I respect and adore her deeply. Even your arrogance is part of your youth. It's something you'll shed as life beats you up a little, drags you around, knocks you out a few times. If you were older and wiser, you would know that your arrogance is going to be a major setback, a pitfall, a ditch you dug for yourself, he said. But you're not. The debt, I repeated. You seem to believe that I owe you something. I believe in settling all my debts fairly. I told him my truth. Some things are priceless, he said oddly. Some debts you can never repay. Some debts can only be settled with your life. You want to kill me? I asked him straight up. You would be worth more debt than alive, he said. All his smiles and fake chuckles turned solemn, serious, and dark. He was frowning now. The lines around his mouth seemed to suggest a permanent frown, that his face had done more frowning than smiling in his lifetime. It was something seeing a man with a family, four sons, and a few homes and properties and cars and a yacht appearing to be so grim rather than be grateful to the Most High. No matter how many words he spoke, I couldn't wrap my mind around what his gripe was about. I couldn't decipher the ways of many of these Christian men. I couldn't even do the math of the debt he mentioned, or the reasoning of how he decided I was worth more dead than alive. So where does that leave us? I asked him, thinking about my women. The hour and a half remaining before the light of the sky fell black and blue, and my hunger from the rigor of the battle of today's championship game. Have you ever known a person hanging on to life by a thread, waiting on a kidney, a liver, a heart? He asked out of nowhere. No, I haven't. What do you think will be more valuable, my yacht or your kidney? Don't know, I said. You're right. You don't know. That's exactly what I've been saying here. You don't know anything. You're too young to know anything. I can sell both of your kidneys, your heart, liver, eyes, and even your bone marrow. I could sell strips of that pretty black skin you have to a patient that understands the pain of fire because he or she has three degree burns and needs skin grafting. I could sell your bones to a medical school that just happens to want bones to display for their anatomy course. I could sell every drop of your blood and even your fingers and toenails, your tongue and intestines. Are you starting to understand why you are worth more dead than alive? If I snatched your heart out right now, and ordered a medical boat to come by and pick it up for delivery to the nearest hospital and to the next applicant on a long line of organ transplant patients. 
How much do you think I'd earn? He smiled an evil smile. Clementine Moody. His name was perfect. I reminded myself of his degrees from the University of Pennsylvania and Harvard School of Business, and that Chiesa had said that he had been a hospital administrator a long time ago. Now he was involved in some private venture that no one spoke about specifically. Is that what you do? You said before that you work as a high-priced consultant. Do you decide who is worth more dead than alive and then kill them and snatch out their heart and other organs and sell them? I'm no murderer. I have high ethics. So only a fraction of your answer is correct. And if you had lived a longer life than your young years, you know that there is no need to murder. The worst human vermin of the world are so good at self-destruction that a wise guy and businessman such as myself need only wait them out. I've encountered thousands of guys like yourself who don't know and never understood the value of life. Thousands of men just like me? I asked him. Oh no. The only thing they have in common with you is their ignorance of the value of life. The rest of the circus you have going on is a thousand percent rare and unique. But I can tell you for sure, same as I told my wife and my brother-in-law, you will be around for a long time. The only way to get you away from Chiesa is to kill you. I can see that. But since we're not in the killing business, we simply need to contain you and your recklessness, he sipped. It's a relief that you're not in the killing business. Point to me to the bathroom, please, I said. He had talked too long. The Amtrak ride had been long, and the rocking of the boat on the waves. I was in need of a hot shower, some scented soaps, a thick fresh towel and either of my wives. Down those stairs, turn left, let's see if you can follow instructions, he said oddly. Down the steps, as I made the left, I saw the door on the right move. It was already mostly closed, but someone had pushed it to shut it completely. In front of the bathroom, I smelt the scent of a woman. I went in, handled myself, washed up, and came out. I closed the bathroom door behind me and paused there in the small space for a few seconds. The door in front of me opened slightly. It was not Marcus waiting on a truce. It was a doe-eyed, voluptuous woman with thick lips looking out. Clementine Moody appeared at the top of the few steps with his shotgun. I told you not to come out, he said to the woman. I didn't. She lied. Come up here and prepare us some more d'oeuvres now that you're out, he told her. You come up first, he said to me. I understood. He didn't want me walking behind her ass, looking up her dress. Since he had already described me as a stranger, I knew he didn't know that I wouldn't. It wasn't my style. Aren't you going to introduce us? She asked him stupidly. Her name is Secret. Now I know one of your secrets. And you know one of mine, he said. I just looked at him. Didn't bother to correct him about how Bangs was not my secret, not my woman, definitely not one of my wives, and I never heard a nickname. You interrupted my family holiday barbecue. Now you are interrupting my date, he said to me wrongly. Now let's get down to the nuts and bolts of this thing so I can power this boat up, drop you off, and get on with my plans. He looked at her back as she was putting together some sandwiches and chips and fruit. I had already turned my back to her so that he wouldn't get any more strange ideas than the ones he already had brewing. Even the superpowers need allies, he said strangely. 
And the thing about allies is they don't have to love each other. They just need to have at least one mutual interest. Okay, I said, not agreeing, but trying to draw out whatever he was getting at. Here's another secret. A big one. A bomb. It's in our mutual interest that you not ever repeat it, he said. So why tell me, I asked. Because I have to stop you from killing even one of my sons. Literally killing or messing up his life because he kills you, he said. Now I felt better. He was talking about Marcus, and all this other crap he was speaking was nothing. Here comes the bomb, he said solemnly. Honey, pass me the notepad, he said to his woman. The notepad was embossed with the capital letters HWM. He wrote down only one thing. Marcus. Then he leaned in and said quietly, He's not my son. Then his woman brought the sandwiches over and set them on the table. By the time she reached us, he flipped his note over face down. Honey, take this back. He's one of the Muslims. He don't eat Virginia ham. Oh, sorry. She rushed over, leaned to pick up the plate, and her cantaloupe-sized b****s were hanging dangerously close to my face. I lowered my gaze. Just bring him a fruit plate and some of those cheese and crackers, he said. I'm good, I told him, despite being mad hungry. What's your reason for telling me he's not yours? I asked. It doesn't add up. Oh, it adds up, all right. Here comes the second bomb. He turned his note to face him and wrote, He is the general's son. The same man whose daughter you married, he said. Now you've stolen away his daughter and crippled his son. Do you think you need an ally now? He asked, and my mind was racing. If he's not your son, what's your interest in it? I asked him. Listen here, you cold-blooded motherfucker. He said quietly through clenched teeth. He is not my son, but Xavier is. Xavier loves Marcus even more than his other two blood brothers. I raised them all as brothers under one roof. Three of them are mine and my wife's sons. Marcus is the general's son. Your wife has no idea that Marcus is a real brother. I'm telling you so that you will understand that Marcus is not trying to sleep with your wife. Therefore, there was no need to bust his kneecap. He looked at me sternly as though he thought I'd be shocked that he knew I was the one who crippled Marcus. The debt goes way beyond the medical bills, which are astronomical, and include surgery, medical supplies, rehabilitation, and therapy, or even the fact that you have probably permanently altered his career in the military and as a fighter and a boxer. The debt is that you are breaking up a respectable family that has been living together happily and peacefully. My wife needs to maintain her relationship with your wife, not just because that's what her brother wants her to do, but because it's what she wants as well. Anybody who causes my wife any grief has made a headache for me. I do everything. A man could possibly do to keep her happy and everything cool. Vineyard. I had looked that word up when I was researching whether or not I would allow my Uma and sister and first wife to accompany my second wife up here. I had also ordered from Marty Bookbinder a map of the island and a travel book that discussed it. Sitting in the exclusivity of a Grand Banks yacht, I felt like I was in the vineyard covered with vines. 
Vines trail and creep and climb and wind themselves around a person, place, or thing. They clasp themselves on and hold tight, all connected. Vines are an entanglement. Sounds like you think Marcus is an innocent victim. Seems like you'd be wise enough to know better. I'm not going to say what Marcus did. I'll let him tell you himself. And since you are a wise elder and a businessman, you must know, and you must have raised him to know, that if men gamble, there are big and small risks involved and that you may suffer greatly. So there is no debt between you and me, Dr. Moody. You want peace for your wife? I want peace for my wife. As long as none of your sons don't offend me or my women, I'll be good to them like a brother. My religion is not a routine or a circus. My objective is family. And the young lady in the photo is not one of my wives. Any woman who is my woman is my wife. If she is not my wife, I do not earn it or... I said to him, man to man. Imagine if I told you that the woman here on my yacht... He said, nodding towards the curvaceous woman in the blue silk dress. Was not my woman. She turned around and smiled. And that I never touched her or her in her, as you say. Then he smiled at me. Darling, take your plate and wait for me downstairs. I won't be too long. He got rid of her. She shot him a look of boredom right before she left. I understood. I was even more bored with him than she was, I'm sure. See, that's the thing about wisdom. If you were older, you'd realize that the good, smart girl is the one you marry. The good time girls are the ones you have a good time with for a few hours or days or weeks or whenever it benefits you. Keep them hidden. Don't tell them or teach them nothing. Not even your home address or telephone number. Your wife is smart. You don't need the good time girls to be smart. They just need to be ready to give you what you want. A good time. He dragged out those last three words like a drawl. How you want it and to do whatever you say. If you try and marry all of the women you lust, you'll give yourself a horrible migraine or a catastrophic heart attack. Shake off that arrogance. One wife is more than enough, and if you didn't destroy this pretty young dang who's standing right next to you smiling in the photo, then you wouldn't be a man, now would you? I remained silent. My strategy was that if I did so, he would be content, and he'd power up the boat and head to the island. He was eating his ham sandwich, cutting it into sections of four, and dabbing his mouth with a napkin each time he finished a portion. Tomorrow, I'd like you to show up at the clubhouse for men-only breakfast family meeting. My sons will drive up for it. We'll smash the beef, work it out and all appear later in the afternoon to the barbecue united. Marcus also, I asked. Yes, he replied. It's been weeks, but his knee is still in bad shape. He'll need to use the whole back seat of my son's truck just to make it up here. Xavier is already up here. He came in the first class car of the same train you arrived in today. This is his camera. He snapped these shots. Just happened to see you. Gave me a call and interrupted my plans for the day. But he's my son, so I had to show up. He's very angry. He loves Chiesa a lot, and he thinks you are making a fool out of her. Is that right, was all I said. He really doesn't want to lose Chiesa. You already injured Marcus, his hero, but Xavier is my son. I can control him. What do you expect to happen at this breakfast? I asked him. My boys will listen to me no matter what. 
I took the camera from Xavier and the photos. He won't have to show them to your wife. He's young and doesn't understand that kind of thing. Marcus is enraged, but he's injured. Can't do anything right now. My older sons are established. They have their opinions, but they won't want to get involved in any of this. They know Marcus is a hothead. He paused. I need you to get in line. Lose that killer energy. Let go of some of that arrogance. Give me your word not to use violence ever again within the family. And definitely not in a family setting. You might not like it, but like I said, allies need only one mutual interest to appear standing side by side. And you and I and my sons and Marcus all have one. Your wife. Measuring Clementine Moody's words, I was quiet. I didn't want to headbutt with him. Definitely didn't want to be drawn into a continuous debate either. Weighing it out, I knew I held the ace card. My second wife had already told me that she would walk away from all of them, although she didn't prefer to do so. Therefore, me working it out with the men in her family was something I could do as a consideration for her and for no other reason. I thought Uncle Clem, despite being paid, PhD'd up, and successful in his business, quote-unquote, was a joke and an illusion. As he steered his yacht to Martha's Vineyard, I thought closely about how, in my first encounter with him, his wife, Aunt Tasha, spoke passionately about church and Christianity. She spoke about how shocking and uncomfortable it made them each feel that Chiesa is now a Muslim. She said that she and her husband and an entire family attend church and talked about how important the Christmas Eve worship was for them. Yet, Clementine Moody seemed to have very low regard for faith. That was burning me up. Standing behind the captain's chair, where he was seated, I asked him, Is your Christian faith a routine? He took his time. I hope that meant he was giving it some honest thought. Religion is for women. For men who have families and who love their wives, we go to church to appease them. Our role in the church is the same as our role in the world. To handle the business. Looking over the new dark waters, I thought to myself, No matter how long I remain in America, I'm a foreigner. Men who don't worship the maker of all souls, men who go to church only to shut their wives up, strange. Men who claim Christianity but who are uncomfortable with the boundaries and limitations of Christianity then disregard all of the rules about how a Christian should live life, strange. Married Christian men who say they love, honor, provide, and protect their one wife, but only if they have the option to disrespect, f hide, and abort their seeds in the women who they desire to go while being married, low, and strange. Men who reach high positions in this country and who enjoy the respect of hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands, and even sometimes millions of people as they run amok. And what about my second wife's father, the general? Why would he give his son up to another man to raise and claim? Why would he hide his seed and only claim his daughter? Strange, strange, strange was all I could come up with. Why did the general hand you his son? I had to ask. Because Marcus was a mistake he made with a good time girl. The girl showed up at her house one afternoon, nine months pregnant, and had the baby on her front lawn before she could even reach the doorbell. My wife and the general are biological brother and sister, and emotionally and in every possible way, they are closer than twins. My wife loved baby Marcus because he was her brother's son, and believe me, she verified it first. She's a doctor. I love my wife. She wanted to keep the baby. The general wanted a clean slate, a do-over. 
My wife wanted to make that possible for him. Soon as Tasha got attached to Marcus, his mother came and snatched him back, not because of love, but because she needed to hold on to him and get that pitiful welfare check. But when Marcus turned 10 years old, he put himself on a bus and showed up at our house looking for his father. We took him in and raised him as our son. He's had the same luxuries as our boys, but different DNA and personality. Even military school failed to change that. He's hot-tempered and short-sighted like his senseless mother, and he's got a heavy chip on his shoulder. He knows who his real father is. His mother told him. The fact that the general didn't claim him and doesn't interact with him has been a thorn in his heart. Every crazy thing he ever did, or may ever do, in the future is just him acting out over his father. A son who is a quote-unquote mistake is unheard of for me. A man grown enough to spill his seed in a womb who wants a do-over. Oh, Allah. I washed and made a prayer on the deck of that yacht before leaving. As Muslims, we do not pray to be seen. At the onset of prayer, after we have cleansed ourselves, we clear our minds to set ourselves straight and to purify our intent. I'll admit, though, I wanted Clementine Moody to see the prayer, to see a man who may saja bring his knees to the ground and presses his forehead to the earth in complete submission to Allah. I thought that perhaps if a man could understand that true believing Muslim men submit only to Allah, they might rethink mistaking the way we carry ourselves, limit ourselves, and what exactly we feel entitled to as arrogance. Take a cab. The stand is to your right once you walk out. You never saw me today, Clementine Moody said as I left. And you never rode with me on any yacht. Chapter 30 Criminal-minded I'm not, but the times were getting more rougher. The projects were pouring into the prisons, and the men were getting more tougher. The crowded streets emptied the street crowds into the cells. Hotter than July, even the heat was getting more meaner. More felons now than misdemeanors, and the mood was intensely tense in this city of men. You have a visitor, the CO called out. His gaze fell on me. Not me, I said, seated in the guard cipher. Ricky Santiago, the CO said, and the locked up looked up, stood up, and paid close attention to the name of the man. Even the CO seemed to know. Paused in a squatting position, only my mind was moving swiftly. Do or die, Ricky Santiago? One of Daquan's captains named Walkie Talkie said slyly. Black, you better take that. I raised up for my own reasons after reaching my own conclusions. I took my walk for the first time to visitation. My first time up here, Santiago said. Mine too, I replied, my natural smile breaking out naturally. What can I do for you, I asked him. He smiled, then laughed a reluctant, restricted, but real laugh. What can you do for me, he said, as we both sat in silence for some seconds. Did one of your machines break? You came all the way here looking for a handyman? Couldn't find nobody else? The repair kit was in each box with the instruction manual, I joked purposely, to lighten up what was already a heavy feeling in a tense atmosphere. Damn, that's more words right there than I ever heard you say, he said coolly. I must have been in here too long, I said. Two days in there is two days too long, he said. That's word, I agreed. The locked lingo. All in me now. Less is more. What had to be done, had to be done, I know, he said, and gave me a serious look. I read it. He wanted me to know that he knew I was no fool. 
I appreciated his words, the words he spoke, and the ones he discreetly insinuated. He was the first one, the only man not to question my motives, or my murder, or whatever action had led me here. The first one to know, without knowing any of the details of my imprisonment, that a man who had all that I had earned, and that Allah had allowed me, would never just throw it all away without reason. I felt in my soul that more than any man, Ricky Santiago knew I had murdered a lesser man for the right reasons. At the same time, his facial expression expressed his regret that a lesser man had not pulled the trigger on my behalf so that the deed had to be done, was done, without getting any blood or dirt on my hands. However, when it is as personal as it was, I would have to be the only one to pull the trigger. Never would have handled that murder over to any other man. Did you come up here to check? I asked him, and he smiled. Anything, anyone, any jewel that I want, choose, or that I plan to purchase, I pick it up myself. I test it myself. I pick it up myself. I verify myself. My man said it was you. Me? I had to see for myself, he said. How's that basketball going? I said, purposely, not to give any words or info away to any authority listening in. It's good as always, man, but no charm, he said. No charm, I repeated. Nothing to go all in on with complete confidence. Just something to watch. There was a pause. How long was all he asked. I had purposely not been counting time, yet I knew in two weeks' time it would be my second birthday of being cuffed and confined. Then I reminded myself that I had been in the bullpen for my last birthday, which meant in two weeks it would mark one year of time served. Two years, I said, if it goes well. Good man in a bad situation, so he never knows what he or they will do, right? He stated. I didn't say nothing. There was no need. I'll put money on your books. Check your commissary, he said. You know I don't like debt, I said. He didn't answer nothing back. There was no need to. Two years, drop me a line round release time. I'll have the limo down front, he pledged. Forget the limo. Park my Maserati and leave my key in the ignition. I'll drive myself. My man, he said, and left. Daquan, the five percenters, and their underlings all had their eyes plastered on my pace and my face when I walked back into the place, the day room. It looked like they expected me to report back on my VIP visitor, do or die Ricky Santiago. They had been huddled, watching murder, she wrote, like they usually did. They'd each tried to solve the crime first. It was just one of Daquan's several competitions, the kind that could be held and managed in a jail setting. Don't watch me, I told them. Watch the TV. The guy in the top bunk. I never referred to him as my soulmate or as my sully as many men do. The same way that Chris and Amir and I built a nine-foot wall around my queen's home, I built an invisible but solid wall between me and him, even though we were both forced to share a sink, a toilet, and a very small space. He was a few years older than me, but in lockup, my solid steel physique, reputation, and confidence outdistanced and outweighed his age. Soon as he arrived in my cell, after the last guy was evacuated, I read him my rules. Don't look at me. Don't ask me any questions. Don't touch my things. Don't talk. Stay out of my way. Clean up behind yourself immediately. He obeyed. Check out your soldier. Daquan handed me a copy of his newsletter, Each One Teach One. It was only one page with stories printed at the print shop on both front and back sides. I flipped it, scanning the two photos 
as well as the article titles. What am I looking for? I asked him. Back page, bottom right hand corner. He told me. I read it. 16 year old adolescent petitions the Rikers Island Jail Administration for permission to marry and wins. For the first time ever, a youth in the Rikers Island Robert Donovan Adolescent Jail has gained permission to host a wedding and marry his 18 year old girlfriend in a jail ceremony. The inmate, who is a minor and therefore cannot be named or photographed, waged a nine month campaign to marry his girlfriend. His first hurdle was to win the permission from his mom, his legal guardian. Her signature was a requirement on the marriage license. That was the part of the process that took the longest, quote unquote, according to community relations counselor Brian Jones. The small ceremony will be hosted on Saturday, August 1st, 1987. I looked up. Daquan had his arms folded in front of him. My soldier? I repeated. The soft dude, who you gave the knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. My brother said he did a 180. You know Deshaun don't respect or acknowledge a man who can't master himself. You told him that, I said. Then I was thinking about Leviticus. Kid owe you his life. You're the father to his stock. Daquan declared. Allah to Lila was all I thought. If a man strives with a good intent and all of his heart and mind to overcome his trauma, and its challenges, there is a reward in it. Then I thought of how the article said the first hurdle was his mother. I could not imagine that she would have been against her son taking a wife when before that ever happened, he was being abused and conquered and disrespected by men she brought around. I wondered if she preferred her son the way he was before, or if she admired the outcome of his efforts to overcome a very difficult situation and circumstance. Tell Deshaun I say good looking now. I handed him back the newsletter. You keep it. Hand it to the next man, Deshaun said. As I folded it, I noticed a black and white photo of a pretty female. Of course I would notice. She had clear eyes that shined and nice brown skin without cosmetics. Sister Lisa, Daquan said. She's coming up here to speak. Speak to who? I asked. All of us, whoever signs up for the program. This is my joint. I got the community relations counselor to invite her up. For what? I asked, not believing there was any reason to invite women into this filthy city of men. Because she's bad. She's young. She's smart. She's a poor, righteous teacher and civilizer of the 85. But most importantly, she runs these camps for the babies. Ask any god up here who got seeds. They all know her, he said. She's an Earth? I asked. Earth was what the gods call their women. They call their mothers their old Earth and their women their Earth. Non-cipher. She's not in the 5%, not in the Nation of Islam, not even a Muslim. I heard she works for the church. But she ain't no nun, and she ain't no joke or nothing like that. Sign up, check her out. You'll only understand once you see her in person and hear her speak. I took a second look at the photo and read the article. I was curious. Besides, it broke up the regular rhythm and routine, and I was part of a captive audience. The mentioning, murmuring, maneuvering, and movement of men around the arrival of this one girl to Rikers Island was extraordinary to me. It was an unexpected, powerful momentum. Men jockeyed to be included, but the number of inmates who could attend topped off at 300. They raised it to 350. When an inmate got suddenly bailed out or moved out or had court appearances and trial dates, the next man would jump for the ticket that he vacated. I was calm and cool. Thought it was somehow funny. Couldn't guess what she would say or do that appealed to the beasts of the jungle. Saturday finally arrived. Us prisoners were filed in and lined up. No chairs. I don't know what the authorities were expecting, but I knew from experience they get agitated whenever large groups of men are moving. Whenever large groups of men are united around anything, even if it is harmless and good for them. Whenever large groups of men are excited, in the gym were all of the COs we were accustomed to seeing, 
but doubled. Ones that usually worked the shift after the others were all here at the same time. Then there was the special forces all riot geared up. Their shields and chemical sprays and sticks and heavy boots and their f***ed up attitudes, postures and dispositions. I was leery watching them watching us and even more so hearing 350 men speaking in hushed tones all at once. The door swung open. She was blocked from being seen by the COs who walked in. Men were stretching their necks, inching sideways, trying to get a look. Then she walked out and away from the COs guarding her in a manner like she didn't want them guarding her in the first place. She stood directly in the front, placed herself right in the center of the men where the aisle divided the crowd into halves. We were all looking at her. At the same time, she began looking at us. It seemed one by one without skipping anyone. She surveyed until her eyes filled with tears. Watching her fill with natural emotion made some of the men emotional. They began clapping for her tears and stomping their feet. CO blew a whistle that was drowned by the sounds of the applause. Then the thunder fell to absolute silence. She looked calm and comfortable. In her eyes was a force. They contained the calm of water and the fury of fire. I wondered how they occupied the same space. Her skin was pretty and clear. She was the opposite of quote-unquote ran through. Her energy was clean. She looked 18 years young and innocent. Either she was or she was a fox with 99 tails. That's more than Aunt Tasha has. I smiled at the thought. I love you, she said, and the men cheered as though it was their first time ever either hearing or believing those words. Maybe both. I love you, not because I am naive, not because I lack intelligence, not because I am unaware that some of you have done wrong on purpose and others of you have done wrong by mistake, and still some have been wrongly accused. I love you because my soul has been missing you. My eyes have been searching for you. My heart has been wanting you, the fathers, the brothers, the son of our hearts. We need you to be home. And the men went crazy, cheering. We need you to be strong. We need you to be capable and above all to be true. We need you to be loving us, the women, as we work together with you, side by side. A person should always know who they are and what purpose they serve. A person should also know who they are not and what they will and will not do or allow to be done with them or to them. A person should also know who they are not and what they will and will not do or allow to be done with them or to them. So I'll start off by telling you who I am not. I am not your bitch. And the men threw their hands in the air, jumped up and down, and hollered like an unseen, unheard of exorcism. I am not a bitch. I am not that naked chick posed and pasted or taped or pinned to your wall while you hawkers. The men were high-fiving, some shocked, some shaking. I am not disrespectful. I am not disloyal. I am not the one who will disgrace you or who you will disgrace, slapping me in my face, punching me in my ribs, or shoving me down the stairs. I am not your bitch, your hoe, your piece, your skeezer, or your baby mama who called the police on you, dimed you out, f***ed your friends, or aborted your seeds. The volume of the men's expression became so wild, the riot guards eased off their posts and stood on either side of the girl facing the inmates with their shields raised up high. I am not the bitch who had your children, then hid them from you, placed a restraining order on you, dragged you into court, and sat silently while the judge ran your pockets. I am not your bitch who lied on you, who stole your money, or pawned your jewels. I am not that bitch you met in the dark, or f***ed you, or f***ed in your car, or in the back of your building, or on the stairwell. The men reacted as though the riot guards were absent. No threat at all. I am not the bitch who says those house without having your heart in my hand, your diamond on my ring finger, and my heart in your soul. She said. And the 
guard stepped up to the crowd. Calm down, or we will shut it down, they threatened. She ignored them. I am not your psychiatrist, or your private eye. I am not your mother. I am not the police. I am not your parole officer. And you are not my hostage, my prisoner, or my slave. So don't be doing the running man when you see me. Look at me with love and affection, she said, placing her hands on her hips and twisted left, then right. Slight gestures that caused a frenzy among the caged. I am your sister. We are family. If someone f*** with you, they f*** with me. The crowd roared. I am a young woman. I am a fighter. I am known for four words. We are at war. The stomping began again. Not because we want to be, not because we ain't got nothing better to do, but because we are. We have been set up. We have been sucker punched. We have been subpawed. We have been stabbed from behind. We've been blindfolded. We've been gagged. We've been wronged. We've been wronged. We've been wronged. We've been held down too low for too long. Now she was covered in a light sheen of summer sweat. She inhaled, then exhaled. She clenched her fingers, and her face filled with ache. Brothers and sisters, we gotta get our hearts right. Love the right things. Hate the wrong things. Brothers, we gotta get our minds right. Read the right books. Write the right words. Rhyme the right lyrics. Sing the right songs. Speak the truth, brothers. We gotta get our souls right. Praise the right God. Because if you are telling me that you are God, you better be the solution and not the problem. That was it. Her words tore the house down. No bodies were still. Even the guards looked shocked and somehow pleased with her and what she was saying and what she was evoking from the men, which they had never before seen. Only God is perfect. Men are not. Women are not. Praise God, not yourself. Not your woman, not your man. Fight your enemies, not your friends, not your family, not your people. Handle your business. Every man knows that every man has to do that. Where my horse was at? She asked, and most of them acknowledged. We right here. Then she stripped them. You are loved. You got the right skills, but the wrong product. You got the right look, young, fine, and fashionable. You got the cars, the jewels, and the women. You got the strong team, but the wrong target. Made the wrong investment and created the wrong results. Men must build more than they destroy. Where my pimps at? She said suddenly, and the men who were normally good at game and sharp and slick failed to peep her next setup. They acknowledged, We right here! She turned a little and leaned forward. You pimping her? Who's pimping you? You dress her up and throw her out on the block or the club or behind the building to spread her legs for paper. Now who's dressing you up and forcing you to spread your legs for paper? The prison system in America! Cheap, forced labor. They dress you up in these odd striped jumpers, green jumpers, orange jumpers, and orange hats. They make you spread your legs and raise your hands and shut your mouth and and get out there and work the whole day for them every day. You earn less than a on a stroll. And the place exploded. Some CEOs broke their stance and laughed. The real pimps are in the government and the corporations. Sometimes they're one and the same. They're collecting the money you earned and not giving you your cut. Check the labels. At least know who's getting paid off of you. Who got the contract to build these prisons? Who got the contract for the heavy machinery? The prison vehicles? The prison weapons? The prison furniture? The prison inventory? Who made those prison jumpers you're forced to wear? Who got the contract for the horrible food they serve you? Who made your bed sheets? Check the labels. See if I'm lying to you. You were supposed to be our army, but the only ones you fight in is yourselves. Men divided by race, culture, faith, and language, all getting pimped by the same politician, the same entities, all cooperating with the same scam. Look around the room. All blacks and Latinos. Latinos and blacks. All Africans and Latinos. Latinos and Africans. All African men. 
Even the African and Latino COs are caught up in the color scheme. She said, and the room went to a hush. They think you're probably the enemy. You think they're the enemy. They got the same problems you got. They think you're the product. They got the wrong product. But both groups are getting pimped by the same two pimps. CO can't pay his rent same as you. And the crowd cheered. CO can't handle his women same as you. CO can't afford his child support same as you. CO can't afford the car he's driving same as you. You're locked up now. CO is locked up in here right with you. It was fire on top of fire, and it was spreading across the room, igniting everything. Then she softened her tone and dropped her convo back into the realm of the personal. I am nothing but a warner. I am nothing but a reminder. A woman. The same woman who will care for your babies. The same babies not born from my womb. The same woman who will raise your daughters and sons to be better men and women than any of us have ever been. I don't hate your women, but I can teach them how to love you. How to get their minds and hearts right. How to see you in a better light. But in order to do that, you have to be a better man. I love the black man, but I need a better product, a purer cut, a finer grain. At that point, I observed cold-blooded killers who had two, three, four bodies on their charges. Men who got nabbed with kilos of cocaine and a truckload of weed. Men who ran guns and pimped women and committed armed robberies and even were on their feet with fists pumping in the air with total loss of composure and cheering like they were at a horse track or an auction or the strip club, but louder and stronger and not from the groin, but from their hearts. I'm calling for a complete humbling of every man and every woman. I am calling for the humbling of myself. I am not your bitch. But if I was, and even if I ever used to be, I am not anymore. And I wouldn't be dumb enough to be bragging about it if I was. Arrogant and proud and flaunting it. I wouldn't be parading around, standing in front of audiences, acting like I didn't know better, didn't plot and scheme to do it, and didn't get nothing out of it. Lying bitches. Fake bitches. And I saw a hard rock cry. If I was your bitch before, I'd be correcting myself now. Work hard. Strive hard. Fight hard. Love hard. Man and woman, woman and man, let's build a nation where we can thrive. Where the police don't reign supreme and the slaughter of our children isn't sport. Where white is just one shade of skin without melanin, not to be worshipped or imitated or served. In the words of Marcus Garvey, one God, one aim, one destiny. In the words of Malcolm X, by any means necessary. In the words of Harriet Tubman, freedom or death. Peace. She took a bow. She tried to catch her breath as she and every man in the room recovered from something that couldn't be described. A bond that couldn't be broken. A woman who could never be forgotten. Words that would revolve around the minds of the oldest men and even around the brains of the most ignorant men. And even within the youngest and darkest of souls. Young, I knew her words would stay with me. I felt I would somehow see her again in another time, in a better place. From the back row where I stood, I remained calm and still, even though I was moved. I see these men every day. I watched her instead. She was wearing jeans and a long sleeve, quote unquote, in the summer, t-shirt that said, love. She was covered. It didn't matter though. Her shape was crazy. She wore pumps, not kicks. She was camouflaged so well, she looked like she wasn't. She looked like a pretty hood chick without the glaze or glamour or attitude. Feminine feeling without any confusion, she looked soft. Her teeth were white and her smile was warm, like she meant it. Bold, her mouth was a machine gun. Her tongue, a machete. There was nothing about her physical look or her ordinary fashion that would give anyone a warning of what she would say or do. She's a powerful bomb, I thought. A bomb with a silencer. No tick or buzz or boom. No red light or alarm to alert people to stay away. Don't touch or tease or insult her. She would not detonate. 
I asked myself, what exactly is the feeling she caused me to feel? It wasn't sexual, although she was lovely enough. It wasn't danger, although she was deadly enough. I wasn't challenged, although she was sharp enough. It was that even though she said she was not naive, and even though she spoke as though she was not innocent, and even though she said she was a fighter, she was naive enough to enter a filthy place, be surrounded by hundreds of men, and feel no fear or sense of personal threat. She wore those tight jeans as though she wasn't standing before a herd of hungry, starved beasts and as though she would not possibly be looked upon as food or prey. She was still a woman to me, ruled by emotion. And I felt a strong feeling and the urge to protect her. They ushered her out. She looked like she wanted to stay. She reached her hand through the guards and touched the hand of every prisoner who was close enough to reach in. Soon as she was gone, all masks came off. The guards turned back into hate, and inmates turned back into the hated, and vice versa. In our darkened cells, men hugged and held the bars. Through the open spaces and the vents, the conversation began. Words of mother, I'm speechless. Yo, Daquan, thanks for the hookup. We should have her speak at the parliament. Next that. She might influence the Earth. I hope she does. Might be better to leave it the way it is. Y'all scared of her. Nah, Cypher. Yo, understanding, I see you shed a tear. Who got her address? How about to write her a letter? She ain't got no time for that. Man, shut the fuck up. I'm about to wife her. She don't want you. She's got high standards. Yeah, but she ain't no gold digger. She's low maintenance. She's a soldier. Daquan said... The minister put out a word of protection on her so the streets don't touch her. Go at her the wrong way, you lose your life. That's how it should be, I said. What minister? You know, the only one who matters. By the end of the week, the vibe flipped. The topic changed. Leviticus's wedding in the youth house happened smoothly. However, his mom got arrested trying to bring in contraband. Now, she's locked up in the Rose M. Singer Center, the Rikers Maximum Security Jail for Women. Daquan lost a mule. Leviticus lost a mother. Brian Jones, the community relations counselor who allowed Daquan to plan events and host speakers, was gone. Word was, he was fired but no explanation was offered to the inmates he counseled or the community relations he formed. I believe he got fired for bringing that bomb into the jail and letting her detonate. Same as teacher Karim Ali mysteriously disappeared for teaching American history in a manner where students were actually interested and participating. Same as I was boxed for praying. It's crazy once you realize that even when you are trying to do good and be true, even when you are walking within legal limits, you are still being stalked and hunted and fired upon. A number of COs got transferred to different houses and had to start all over again. Inmates got shifted and shipped out and cells changed. It was a shakeup that no one admitted was happening. The unspoken truth. No one wanted us to learn or grow or change. They needed us to remain in physical stagnation and bondage and in criminal state of mind. Whether behind the wall or out in the street, I say thank you for tuning to Ralph Reed's I would like, or rather love, to thank you queens and kings, fellow royalty, for stopping by. If you would like to leave a small donation or connect with me on social media, please go to www.solo.to forward slash rgmc2407. Check out the music channel of the same name at rgmc2407. Find me on threads, X, IG, all that at rgmc2407. And of course, right here on T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks.
We are Ronin. Fellow royalty, pick up a good book, read a good story, and set your good self free. I appreciate you, and I love you like cooked food. I hope to see you folks on the next edition of this Sister Soldier miniseries on Ralph Reed's. Can't you see they need us divided? They'd be all powerless against us united.